With each generation comes a new black Christmas movie, I guess. There's the original classic, the gory-ass 2000s one, and the terrible third one, whose lesson is that if you protest petty shit like the Dean statue, you will get your friends killed. So guess which one we were really excited to get to. Enjoy. Should I start talking about Black Christmas, or do I reference that every Christmas I end up looking like a damn idiot? You know what's more annoying than Olaf? Wearing his skin! Plus, with his giant tooth obstructing my view, there's always pieces of broccoli that get stuck in there that are impossible to get out. Unlike my previous Christmas onesies, though, this one comes with warm hugs. Oh, yeah, great. After this review, I'll wear this to the local shopping mall and offer out free hugs. That'll go over swimmingly. Alright, well, there's a new Black Christmas movie coming out, just in time to remind us that not that long ago there was another new Black Christmas movie. So I might as well watch the original 1974 Black Christmas. Oh, thank God, that one's actually good. I still look like a fool! Originally intended as more of a straightforward slasher film, the movie was brought to us by director Bob Clark, who would later go on to direct another Christmas classic, A Very Porky's Christmas. The original script for the film is by Roy Moore? What? Well, he's not much of a politician, but damn can he write a Christmas horror film! Anyway, the script was updated to not only give the story a university setting, dealing with a group of sorority girls being stalked by an unseen killer and perverted phone calls, but to also give the sorority a much more realistic feel, as opposed to having them hit each other with pillows for 90 minutes. The movie was originally given the title of Silent Night, Evil Night for a U.S. release because, no joke, the producers were worried that audiences would think it was a black exploitation movie. Well, uh, it wasn't, but, man, it would have been awesome if it was. Hell, when it was going to premiere on TV in 1978, it was given the title of Stranger in the House until an actual double murder at a sorority house happened and the movie was pulled. Look, just keep the title Black Christmas. Nothing good comes from changing it, apparently. The worst that'll happen is a couple of shitty remakes. This cult classic features names behind and in front of the camera. There's Lois Amityville, Norma Bates, The Year 2001, A Nightmare on Elm Street reference, and a Michael Rappaport prototype. This movie truly begins where the ending credits to A Christmas Story leave off. Despite the good reviews the movie has, it's leaving me very angry because I'm being reminded of To All A Good Night and Sorority House Massacre. And I haven't even reviewed Sorority House Massacre. Should probably get on that at some point. College parties never go wrong in these movies. <laughs> It's always a mistake to invite a slasher killer. Sure, they bring their own camera, but they end up killing a lot of people. And now he's looking through the dorm window? Could be worse. Could be gross-out Gombrowski. I'll take the killer. Why do you need me to review the movie when it already has Gene Shalit? I'm egg not gonna lie, this party has a Cuban mistletoe crisis, so pass the cigars and celebrate the birth of our baby Jesus, I'm drunk. Three hours later, the killer finally makes his way to the attic. Follow the smell of cigarettes and scotch and you'll find the Superman premiere party. These fanboys are always trying to break into Margot Kidder's house. They really want that great Waldo Pepper autograph. 
Or they just hang back and make moaning crank calls. <laughs> he does this every night. We think he's making love to a toaster. Who could this be? No, Claire, that's the Mormon Tabernacle Choir doing their annual obscene phone call. Wrong! The Mormon Tabernacle Choir leaves crank phone calls with the sounds of them playing a riveting game of balderdash. They certainly don't say this! Lick it! Lick it! Let me lick your pretty picky cunt! Don't worry, people. All scary threats like this will be taken out of the new PG-13 version. That's how I like my slasher films! Good and safe! Bring the kids! Barb has heard strange voices telling them to get out before. It'll take care of itself. Just don't call Father Rod Steiger. He won't help. Anyway, as the penguin enters to bring them all dead fish as gifts, that's a lot of red herrings. This is Max been looking all over for you. Oh, little puss. The cat did it. This is when we as a society thought it best to not wear people as formal gowns. <laughs> because they end up killing you with cutaways. Save some of the rest for us, Barb. We've only had two whole bottles of whiskey to ourselves. Just get to the reveal that this is Zac Efron going method playing Ted Bundy again. I don't know about this house. There you are. I think this sorority house is the last place you would need to hide booze. At this point, I think the killer himself is just a walking bottle of Jack Daniels. Now it's Rhea Perlman's turn to answer the phone call. <laughs> but I'm more interested in seeing Claudius from Caligula brush his teeth. Again, walk three feet and there's an open bottle of booze on the table. Plus, I think that's mostly urine at this point. And where the hell is Claire? That's when they learn that autoerotic asphyxiation is really more of a frat brother thing. Unfortunately, Claire's dad is in town. When he isn't doubling as the scientist from the Hand of Pleasure, he's looking for his daughter, but this dude has long enough hair. He could be Claire for the day. Sorry, bro. I heard she's at the house with Gene Shallot as Santa. Ho, 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 shit. Gene doesn't put as much work into his puns during the holidays. Dad is mostly shocked that Widow Granny from Looney Tunes used to be one of the house mothers. Mrs. Mac here has no idea that the girl switched her booze with maple syrup months ago. This is just a sugar rush she's on now. Hell, I think even the picture may be a red herring. That dead kid is definitely haunting something in this world. As if you'd need that in this house. God damn it, Claude, you little prick! Claire's dad, are you the killer? Claire, meanwhile, still hasn't climaxed yet, and Jess interrupts Pierre Dulé's Peter during his Dave Clark 5 audition. I'm pregnant. <laughs> Jess, that's fantastic. I don't want it. You don't want it? Didn't you see the movie made by the drunkest, rapiest frat brother in the school? Abortion is wrong. Considering this movie was released only a year after Roe v. Wade, that makes this a fairly provocative horror film for the time. Kier did a little too good of a job opening the pod bay doors. Oh, thank God, the crank caller is a lot less awkward. What your mother and I must go in... This was before the New York Ripper really perfected his quacking voice. I'm sure the police will help. Well, what the hell are you planning to do about it? You. Shut up. Well, best take it up with the Greek Council and let the homecoming carnival decide what to do with the caller. Wait, are you the crank caller? It's, uh, fellatio 20880. Great. Now, thanks to this erection I have, I definitely can't go to the mall afterwards. <laughs> Warm hugs. More like bad hugs. Claire's boyfriend, Chris, can help, but after this goal... Peter, however, is Malcolm McDowling the hell out of this audition. Sorry, but we just don't think you're right to play Peter Noon in the Hermit's Hermit story. Let's get a real cop in here. Sorry, ma'am, I only investigate dream crimes. 
While investigating another missing girl named Janice, Chris demands that they also look for Claire. Look, I came down here in such a rush that I grabbed Claire's coat by mistake, but I assure you I'm really mad. At least someone is back cheering up, Dad. There's a certain species of turtle that can screw for three days without stopping. Then they lit a match in front of Barb's mouth and the house exploded and they all died. I take it the audition went well. Sure, Peter could be the killer, or he's just angry the judges told him he doesn't look enough like a 70s throw pillow. Everyone combs the park looking for Janice and Claire, and if you have time, please keep an eye out for my keys. This is all really just a cover so you can all help me find my keys. On the plus side, they've captured the killer from the toolbox murders. This killer, however, realizes it was a mistake to douse the house with tuna juice. Mrs. Mack looks for the cat and that there may be a whole wild turkey in the attic. <laughs> She was about to die five minutes later of alcohol poisoning anyway. The killer did her a favor. Doesn't mean the killer can't be pissed off, though. <laughs> he waited too long. He killed her after she officially drank all the booze in the house. Now all that's left is diet root beer. As their instant shanty town is interrupted, the body of Janice is found. This is not the time for a phew, glad that's not my kid. But it is time for another phone call. Hello? Oh, it's just Annie chewing on her gum again. Really only 25% of the time is it the killer. Now they have Mrs. Mac to look for, because unfortunately the new Mrs. Mac is even drunker than the original. And there may be a creeper in the house. Peter, Jesus, you scared the hell out of me. Let's face it, even if Peter or anyone else here isn't the killer, they have still definitely killed at least one person in their life. The officer is on his tenth. Calm yourself, woman, you're being hysterical. But let's get to the real suspense. I'm quitting the conservatory and we're getting married. We'll see what happens to the biggest fan of the movie Voiceless after the break. And now what becomes of that sincere proposal? You can't ask me to drop everything I've been working for and give up all my ambitions because your plans have changed. Bravo for resisting the urge to say, I'm sorry, Dave, but I cannot do that. These broads are really ruining our Christmas, Chief. A high school girl's been murdered. Mr. Harrison's daughter is missing. Don't you think we ought to look into it, Nash? Eh, uh, John, it's the 70s. They'll work their own shit out. <laughs> I guess he's right. Come on, boys, let's go bowling. And let's tell Officer Nash that he got Margot. Well, that's the number at the sorority house. <laughs> Barney Miller after dark was pretty funny. I still don't know why she won't marry this guy. You selfish bitch. You're talking about killing our baby as though you were having a wood removed. I'm used to this character being portrayed as the hero in most movies I watch, which is really throwing me off. Let's get one thing straight. You are not going to abort that baby. I don't know what to say here. I'm shocked. The guy is creepy, and it's intended to be creepy. In movies like Voiceless, I always have to add in the creepy music myself because the movie's not self-aware. Now they must watch over the girls with their bulletproof flannel and tap their phones. This has something to do with one of them definitely being Linda Lovelace. I think I know where this is going. Are there any other phones in the house? Uh, yes, the house mother has a number. Yeah, but it's room. another number and there haven't been any calls in it. Mm -hmm. The call is coming from inside the win a stranger calls inspiration. Phyllis, however, is losing it. For the last time, I'm not Gilda Radner. I'm Andrea Martin from SCTV. At least the killer has a hobby. <laughs> that dude is gonna bang that dead body. The killer can't be Peter. He's outside trying to figure out the easiest way to commit a mass shooting. Plus, Barb is having an asthma attack. Just shoot purified schnapps right into her lungs. She needs three days to sleep this off, but I have a new theory. Oh, 
great. The kids from Devil Times 5 are the killers. Should have seen that coming. Though he figures out a cure for a hangover, a unicorn horn right into the head. That's what a hangover feels like anyway. Wait, those eyes. I know who it is. Those are some David Hess eyes. He's mad he was stuck directing to all a good night and not this much superior dead sorority girl movie. This is where the killer reveals that he's very nosy. <laughs> Just like having a wart removed. With this editing, the call is coming from inside the Discovery One. There's more important things than the dead girls, though. The Bumpuses shot a cop in the ass when he spooked their dogs. Meanwhile, Franco Zeffirelli calls to give her a more messed up love story than Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> Jess, we can't kill Davey. Please, Jess, we can't, can't kill Davey. Look, Peter, it's important that we get rid of the baby. It stops the director from making baby geniuses. It doesn't help in finding the killer that everyone in this town seems to lurk outside the girl's window. Well, what do you want? Well, we wondered if you'd seen anything peculiar tonight. Yeah, just a couple of strangers being peeping toms. They may actually be safer outside, or not. Barb, are you awake? Unrelated, she's just being visited by three Christmas ghosts. She'll be back at the end and much happier. Hey, wait a minute. These calls are coming from inside the house on Sorority Row. You pig. You fat pig. Told you the cat did it. Plus, they found another dead body. This time, a butchered cover of Piano Man. And yes, the calls are coming from inside the house. He says the calls are coming from number six, Belmont Street. Nah, she got it wrong. That's where the calls are going into. That's where they're coming from too, sir. <laughs> That's not the line. To make things worse, their protector choked on a holiday ham sandwich. Jez is asked to calmly leave the house or just stay inside. It is really cold out. The caller is in the house. The calls are coming from the house. Close enough. I'm really glad the newer Black Christmas movies made the bold move of taking out that pesky suspense. Phil! Bob, please answer me! Please answer me! Oh, and the good acting, too. That'll just get in the way. Mood? What mood? We need to cater to 13-year-old girls. It'll be the world's scariest Instagram account. Remember, if you don't like PG-13 slasher movies, that just means you don't like any PG or PG-13 horror movie. That's totally what that means, and not that it's specifically a slasher film. Just like how Deep Throat 2 was criticized because all non-X-rated comedies are bad. Yeah, that's it. You may think this is terrifying, but Jess didn't really like these girls anyway. And David Hess is still pissed off. The movie makes an original choice of never telling us who the killer is. And considering everyone in this town hates this sorority, there's plenty of theories. So I'm gonna go with it's the unseen hunter from Bambi. Just think, if the budget had been even lower, we could have gotten a very Johnny Charo Christmas halfway through. Even Peter looking through the window and asking to help seems terrifying. Good God, it's a good thing the sorority houses started installing bulletproof windows after 1974. She needs help. Dennis Yost of the Classics 4 broke into her basement. Let's face it, though. It really is the best that someone finally did something about Peter. So much for Dave returning in 2010. That solves that mystery. But it is the wrong time to ask Jess to be his new daughter. Dad still has the worst timing. Let her sleep it off so we can get to the creepy as hell ending. The killer is not only still alive, but the police still haven't found Claire, who's left to gaze out the window for all eternity. That's more quietly chilling than the weather, and I live in Chicago! Black Christmas was not only a very early entry into the slasher genre, but as you can see, it was also the inspiration for a number of movies that came after. We may not know who the killer is, but perhaps we can find the answer in, uh, When a Stranger Calls, Don't Answer the Phone, House on Sorority Row, 
um, Neighbors 2, Sorority Rising. It was even a big inspiration for John Carpenter's Halloween, which is why if they did do a sequel, it probably would have turned out the killer is also Jess's brother. Bob Clark is certainly versatile when it comes to Christmas movies, having directed one of the most beloved family Christmas films of all time, and one of the best Christmas-themed horror films, with enough sinister atmosphere and memorable characters to last through a few Christmas movies, just not these. Then again, maybe I'm just not being fair. I haven't seen the new Black Christmas yet. I'm sure it'll surprise us and be really, really good. Good. The original film inspired Halloween. Maybe the new Black Christmas can inspire a witty promotional hashtag. <laughs> Darling, you can't rape a townie. While the original 1974 Black Christmas is a classic, the 2006 version still serves a purpose by allowing all people to come together during the holidays to say, meh, at least it's better than the 2019 one. The film was written and directed by Glenn Morgan, who had previously made the 2003 remake of Willard, and with this film, he set out to make a respectful remake of the original film, which would have paid tribute to Bob Clark's horror classic and slasher films in general. Plus, in writing the film, he took inspiration from real-life serial killer Edmund Kemper. But not all of that came through in the final product due to so many clashes between the producers and the film's director over the film's tone and ending, which resulted in a ton of reshoots, different cuts of the movie, and a trailer that doesn't even feature scenes from the film. The movie was a production nightmare that remained largely forgotten due to the original film still holding up to this day. Though it did carry on the tradition of causing a controversy from religious groups who got all up in arms about such a violent movie being released on Christmas Day. Luckily, this was still back in the day when we just ignored bullshit outrages. Now let's see who brought us this severed eyeball as a replacement for coal in our stockings. <laughs> yeah, no shit. Ah, uh, sorority houses, where there's plenty of items just laying around waiting to be used as slasher weapons. This movie still gets Christmas right. You gotta get good and drunk. Naturally, there's a killer somewhere in here. Could he be in the closet? Or could he have shrunk down and jumped down there? Oh, come on. The scissors were right there! Meanwhile, at Smith's Arkham Grove, where things may be dark and grungy, but they still get into the spirit of Christmas with cookies, milk, and a wreath that none of the patients will see. And in case they escape, best leave them with some slasher killer gloves and boots and a robe for this guy. Happy birthday. Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, well, uh, at least one of the patients is trying to keep the Christ in Christmas. They even have someone dressed as Santa. That way, a 40-year-old mental patient will have a lap to shit on when he's asking for a Tonka truck for his ass. Now we begin hearing the story of Billy Lenz, who was abused by his mother and something something. Just pretend he's the killer from either pieces or don't go in the house. Billy tries to escape every year to be home for Christmas, what is this, a Jingle Bell Halloween? I think Michael Myers and Billy together could form as one and make Jack Skellington. Kyle, mm. it's late. But enough about that! Like in the original, things are interrupted by strange phone calls. Hello. J -I -M -G -L -E. Great, Frank Sinatra's drunk dialing again. There's plenty of familiar faces here at the sorority house. There's Mary Elizabeth Die Hard 4 isn't a Christmas movie, Harriet Trachtenberg the Spy, and the Queen of Christmas herself, Lacey Chabert. I really, really, really wish this movie would get mixed in during a marathon of all of her Hallmark Christmas movies. It does, ironically, make sense her being here. Bob Clark directed the original, who would go on to make a family Christmas movie. This one co-stars Lacey Chabert, who also goes on to make lighthearted Christmas films. 
I'm sure the girls will be safe. Billy's locked in tight. No, don't open that. Shit, I knew we shouldn't have left him in the room that had a giant hole in it. The original movie had such mystery to its unknown killer. And here, oh, there he is. Ugh, who produced this movie anyway? Uh oh. Wait, that's the producer Glenn Morgan fought with? Oh, why wouldn't you trust Weinstein's slasher movie wisdom? After all, he produced Halloween Resurrection. These kills are starting fast. The killer didn't even stop first to grab a limited edition Arby's deep fried turkey sandwich. He wants to taunt these girls right away. He's got plenty of Christmases to make up for, and we gotta get to the whole dead body in the attic thing. What are you doing? <laughs> Could you not do that? How is Claire supposed to answer what she's doing? Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Billy's still at the hospital? How can this be? Because there's two killers. Oh, what do you mean it's from the producers of Scream? Also, Santa has the blood shits. The girls have a tradition of having a stocking for Billy, and someone has a problem with that? If we can't use the Lord's birthday to honor mass murderers, what the hell else do we do on Christmas aside tell horror stories? Billy lived here. That's a dog turd. Now we flash back to 1970. No, go to 1974. That's when the better movie is. Billy Edward Lenz was born with a rare liver disease that gave him yellow skin. So it's Sin City now? The parents do not want Billy, and they are prepared to out-bah humbug each other. Ugh, just get to the part where they toss him off a bridge and he grows up to become the penguin. They may live in a big house, but they're still so broke that Billy also has to be the family dog. Billy then witnesses his father being murdered and has to be imprisoned in the attic before asking, why be cheap with the plastic bags when you could spring for some wrapping paper? That shows that you care. Anyway, really girls, you should already know this story. We have a tradition of Billy stockings. How the hell do you not know who he is? But there's gonna be at least one of them who gets him confused with that other Christmas Billy horror movie. Oh, don't worry, it's still a Black Christmas remake, hence the phone calls. You want a Christmas cookie? You're my cookie. cookie and I could gobble you up. Maybe we shouldn't honor Billy the Killer anymore. Another thing it has in common with the original is that the characters are still getting shit-faced when mixed in with other movies. I give it to Billy. See, now it's turning into She's All That. But back to the flashbacks, what a random structure this movie has. You can't tell this was carelessly assembled in the editing room. There's no rhyme or reason to these flashbacks. Let's just insert Billy's horny mom raping Billy, and then boom, incest baby is born. Well, now that Flowers in the Attic is done, Eve here leaves before she could get her gift of a red herring. It's going to be very easy for the killer to randomly pick off these girls. Aside from the drunk one, they have no distinct personalities and are completely interchangeable. How would the killer even know who to prank call? I'm going to bury that. Was not Megan. <laughs> what? Really? Maybe it's this guy. Hey girls, did someone order a shitty boyfriend to get killed later? Oliver Hudson plays, I don't know, let's call him Kyle Gyllenhaal. What's his story? You mean after he washed down his Christmas cookies with a glass of milk? Never mind, let's go back to Billy imprisoned in the attic and the incest baby. Points to this movie for going full sleaze, but all of these flashbacks are like watching the flashbacks in Silent Night, Deadly Night 2 if Silent Night, Deadly Night 1 never existed. Thank God the Weinsteins didn't give studio notes on A Christmas Story or Ralphie's fantasy sequences would have been extremely graphic. No, he's killing his gross family. <laughs> I wish this movie was in 3D. As if that wasn't gruesome enough, let's Texas Chainsaw Christmas this and have him make Christmas cookies out of his mom's skin, which he then eats. He'll be fine. He's off to Bob Clark's sanitarium, made for people who went crazy after repeat viewings of Rhinestone. Anyway, girls, after that extra dose of cannibalism and in my incest story, who wants to have sex with me? Oh right, Claire's sister is there to look for her, after her dad was busy still stuck in line buying gift cards at Target. 
either this is leading to where the killer is hiding, or they're subtly wanting me to watch something else. Great, Andy Dufresne is the killer. But oh my god, Billy is leaving behind his old presence. No, that's not what's on the box, and it's way too late for returns! I feel like I'm getting to know these characters a little better now. <laughs> See, I've also had way too much rumple mints. Oh, and there's also a sex tape subplot. Now it has porn. This is hitting all of the exploitation marks. Am I gonna show up on there? Isn't sex enough, Kyle? You need a little visual trophies to get your trophies. Shut the fuck up! Whatever. Get back to the plot that I care about. <laughs> That's right, whether or not drunk girl can make it to the toilet. Now let's take a break as we ponder whether or not this movie will feature shit eating, piss drinking, or sucking brains through a plastic straw. And now it's time for What If It Exploded, hosted by Lloyd. <laughs> and this has been What If It Exploded, hosted by me, Lloyd. Now that we're back, let's wipe your head down and get you something greasy to eat. You know what else I like about this? You're a better sister to me than my own sister. Yeah, and Dick Cheney's a better sister to you than your sister. Timeless. But while they accidentally start remaking other Bob Clark movies like Porky's, we should check in on the other girls. What? I'm not the totally helpless daddy's girl these bitches make me out to be. A Bitch's Christmas, coming this Sunday to Hallmark. Seriously, I've watched 20 Lacey Chabert Christmas movies just waiting for one of them to feature her just lighting up a cigarette halfway through. Or this. I would have been very surprised if that happened in Christmas at Pemberley Manor. Especially because she wasn't even in that one. Part of me wonders, if you stopped this movie now and put on the second half of the Sorority Row remake, if anyone would even notice. By the way, Billy is calling to say that Agnes, the incest baby, is the second killer. Oh no, we're not supposed to find that out till later. Instead, let's run outside and get some use out of that fake snow we paid for. <laughs> Plus, the severed head came with the fake snow. Oh, he's out here. Again, thanks. On the bright side, the phone works. The downside, the cops don't give a shit. They don't want to walk into another to all a good night situation. That would be embarrassing for all. You girls are on your own. So they argue about whether they should try leaving in the car or stay in the house, where a slasher bad Ronald can just pop up out of nowhere. Listen to Mary Elizabeth Winstead. She was in the Thing prequel, so do the most stupid thing you can think of that's wildly inferior to the previous. I like the added touch that even when a killer is chasing you, Winter will still find ways to be the bigger pain in the ass. And that's with exploding blood airbags, and that's not even the silliest part of the scene. That death happened regardless of there being a killer. Speaking of the killer, could that be Agnes? Maybe. I'm not sure who it is, but I know one thing. She's got a mean ice skate throwing arm. Plus she knows the perfect cure for a hangover. Death. Now that Eve is dead, Kyle's got to burst back in here to be another red herring. He had to loan the professor some money for an abortion. This is really going to put a damper on things when they hang up Billy's stocking for Christmas next year. You know, they could just run outside and bolt like crazy. But no, there's way more dark spaces to check out. Hmm, I don't think Kyle's the killer. This is a movie for everyone who thought the original would have been way better if they discovered Claire's body and we see the killers, complete with one-liners, cannibalism, and a giant fight in the attic with more exposition. That's right, fake eyeball, that means the second killer is Agnes, the incest sister daughter, because it's important that it's also a slasher movie take on Chinatown? But don't forget Bart Simpson is still hiding in the walls. 
I don't even need to be watching this part of the movie. Before it even started, I could tell you it was going to end with a giant fire getting started in the sorority house and the girls having to escape while the killers are possibly burnt alive. Well, I guess the movie's over. Wait, there's 15 minutes left? Movie, you're too drunk! I'm cutting you off! We needed the extra scene of the coroner getting killed, since where Black Christmas ends, Friday the 13th, the final chapter begins. Why do I have the feeling another studio note was just get this movie to 90 minutes by any means necessary, and if you don't have enough kills, just cut to some shots of a TV playing Knights in White Satin. It worked for Rob Zombie. Hopefully the Saint Reshoots Hospital covers her insurance. The original ending was supposed to end more subtle, with the survivors getting a phone call from maybe Billy, who was supposed to be dead. Uh, but shock to the face, I think that might be better. What else do you got? Nelson Muntz being beaten with a crutch? Getting warmer. Impaled by Christmas Tree! Why Dimension Films? You've done... something again! Although props for not having a cliffhanger ending, I'll give you that. It is wrapped up in a giant impaled bow. Boy, critics didn't like this one and neither did the audience, especially when compared to the influential original film. But looking at it now, 14 years later, I'll say this about it. It's not scary, it's not suspenseful, some of it's unintentionally funny, and the characters are terribly written with no personalities, but there are things that carry it. It is so unapologetically sleazy, it near rivals an Italian giallo film in the sleaze department. And it does deliver the slasher goods with very over-the-top kills, right down to a Christmas tree being decorated in eyeballs and severed heads. Some movies would stop at the incest. This movie continues with human flesh sugar cookies. If it's scares you want, the original has that. If it's pure exploitation you want, that's what this one's for which is a lot more than I can say about the PG-13 latest film, which was just a trojan horse college lecture that I'd sneak into just to take a nap before my next class. And this has been another episode of Killing Time Before a Wrestling Christmas Miracle Comes Out. What gives? You were supposed to be out last weekend. I am waiting patiently for a wrestling Christmas miracle. Fuck you, Santa Claus. When I was walking through the mall, it turns out, if you're dressed like this, they'll just immediately give you a job handing out candy in Santa's village. So why'd you take the job? It was across from Annie Ann's. I really like their samples. Why are we just standing here? Because I ate all of the candy I was supposed to hand out. And when you do that, they want you to replace it. There's only one guy I know of who will give us Christmas candy on the down low. Mm -hmm. Who is that? Oh, God, no. Ho, ho, ho! Welcome, children! I see someone's come back for Santa Christ Christmas candy! Children, I'm gonna be 40 this month. I certainly don't dress like it. Ho, ho, ho! You look like Harvey if Jimmy Stewart got drunk on Pepto Bismol! What? I know what you came for, children, but we're gonna definitely shake things up this year. How so? Santa Christ wants his candy to appeal to a new audience. So this year, I'm gonna skip the candy and give the children what they really want. My opinion on current events. What? What? No, no, that's not why I'm here. Too late! There! Now I can look down on you and feel superior in every way. Your soapbox looks cheap and pandering. Oh, so now you hate all soapboxes! What? No, no, that's not what I said! But wait, let's hear him out. Maybe it'll be subtle. Yes, let us not forget that It's a Wonderful Life also had a message, therefore making anything I say good. Those are the rules nowadays. There was in North Jerusalem, when my trip took a turn for the problematic, when the patriarchy reared its ugly head and kink-shamed Santa Christ while culturally appropriating Italian plumbers. 
when in reality only few had tried whipping the maple syrup from my blood. You know what this is reminding me of? rock -a doodle What? No. Black Christmas, 2019. Oh, yeah. We should probably talk about that movie. Yeah, let's let him finish his soapbox. Hopefully the candy will show up soon. The 2019 Black Christmas remake is a very charitable film which gave the 2006 Black Christmas the greatest gift of all. By being so bad, it made that one look quite alright in retrospect. Directed by Sophia Takal and co-written by Takal and April Wolf, the movie seemed to make some missteps from the beginning. It's not so much that it's a slasher film cut to a PG-13, but the director purposefully sought out a PG-13 to make it accessible to new audiences. Ah yes, the PG-13 slasher film, co-word for this is going to be a terrible slasher film. Aw oh, man, who doesn't remember being a kid and thinking, what? Oh my god, you guys, there's a new slasher movie out and it's PG-13? I can't wait for mom to take us. This is going to be so cool. This is going to be even better than that comedy that cut out all the funny parts. Not saying there aren't great horror movies not rated R, but in terms of slasher films, it's a little hard to do that when you can't show one of the words in the genre. Just like when R-rated Deep Throat Part 2 couldn't show any deep throating. The movie's also a feminist revenge movie as it's about sorority sisters facing off against a cult of rapey frat boys. There's nothing wrong with that being in the movie. The original film had a subplot about abortion, but while that was effectively used not only to build up a red herring, but was treated very serious and added depth to characters big and small and made the situation very real. This is a buzzword movie that's less like a movie script and more like a tweet thread. Saying this is like the original Black Christmas, cause both have politics, is like saying Birdemic is just like the birds, cause they both have feathers. Although it probably looks bad that it's two dudes reviewing the movie on the internet. No, oh, no, no, it's okay. Remember, we got Laura to watch the movie with us, see? Well, personally, I thought that the movie- And as you can see, she'll tell us that the movie is really bad and that we should review it. Phew, got up easy on that one. <laughs> yeah. With it being a Bloomhouse movie, you know it costs $5 million or under, which, again, gives it no excuse for a PG-13. They still would have made their low budget back. The opening quote comes in demanding a like and a retweet. Uh, with proper education, man can be Freddy Krueger. Who on earth wrote this quote? Ah, now I see. They've all come together for the holidays to worship the god of Alan Ladd. And with credits playing over the fire, you're right. I should be watching The Beyond instead. Just like if you're a kid wanting to get into horror films, including political ones, you could, I don't know, just watch Black Christmas. But this one has the Black Christmas Yule Log, as it sits burning men's tears. No, they're just preparing for their wake for the first person killed in the movie. They're happy because she was the one who never threw away her uneaten food before putting the dish in the sink. The killer is ready to PG-13 her, which means confusing her to death with a pig cat emoji. Oh, thank god a monk is here, he'll tell her that the correct answer is both taste great with a nice glaze and covered in pineapple. I've seen a lot of slasher films where the person runs to knock on a random house, but this here might be a first. <laughs> By George, does the killer also own this house too? And since we can't actually show what's going to be done with this, let's just sprinkle some syrup on it and lick it for a dessert. Remember when John McClane killed someone with an icicle? This is that if it were called Die Soft 2. Die Softer. I remember when I first saw this and pointing at this image and saying, Ha! That's a dick! But now, knowing how the movie ends, I'm pretty sure that actually is foreshadowing. Which shows you that you're about to watch something as subtle as a snow angel's dick in the snow. Like in all Black Christmas movies, our leads are a group of sorority sisters, only these characters get all their clothes from Club Yaz Queen while living in a luxurious dorm on a studio lot. After they've had their breakfast, a foreshadowing. Oh, okay, good, because I thought it sounded cute, like Dickensian or something. Wait, Dickensian? Dick? Dick at the beginning of the film? Brilliant! The statues are all very confused at trying to put this mystery together. The banana obviously signals that Attila the Gorilla has gone on a sorority girl-killing rampage. 
They do still get some learning in on this campus, though I'm not sure why they all signed up for Strawman 101. The very language and logic modern woman uses to assail patriarchal culture were the invention of men. Hmm, not one of Hannity's best books. There hasn't been a single reference to the war on Christmas. Who here can tell me what they think this writer is trying to suggest? It's that Santa Inc. was an abomination. Have I not made this clear enough? Look, I drew the female and male symbols on the chalkboard. That should tell you these arguments are going to get as deep into the sexes as God's Not Dead does with religion. I can't imagine why anyone would want Professor Carrie Elways fired. Very difficult for me to do my job when there's a petition circulating to have me fired. Facts care not for your feelings. I will continue to indoctrinate you all by just chanting Let's Go Brandon throughout the entire lecture. It's all I have! But there's really no heroes in the movie. If you're not a misogynistic professor, you're a self-righteous, narcissistic asshole. You already got the college to remove the Founders bus from the administration building. Isn't that enough crusading? Uh, no. Calvin Hawthorne was a racist and a sexist. He owned slaves. Oh, so you're gonna drop out and go to another school? What? No. How can I pat myself on the back and tell people I'm a good person if I do that? Again, the first movie had a message, too. This one? I mean, are we just supposed to not study the classics? Whose classics are they? Will you at least sign my petition? You of all people should care. I thought we were sisters. We don't want to confront the white supremacist patriarchy. Yes, come on. Split a snickerdoodle with me? No, no. It would be a nice message that says no matter your politics, you can still be the biggest asshole in the room. If it actually intended on having that message. But uh-oh, here comes Landon to be a possible love interest for our lead, Riley, if he doesn't screw this up. Sorry for the wait. No worries, I, I don't mind waiting. Sorry, that was really... Thank you. You know who else liked iced coffee? Hitler. Try getting out of that one. Shit, this is Black Christmas. I thought it was a buzzword Christmas, or whatever overused line they throw in. I can handle it. What's the worst that can happen? Black Christmas, as written by Bubsy. Maybe it's time to check back in on Santa Christ. Let me look at his live feed. Possibly he's gotten around to getting us the candy. Bubsy was very problematic, children, as it expressed cat supremacy while downgrading the doggy middle class by using dog whistles such as poodle queens. Maybe we should take a break. I don't know. I almost want to see where this goes. Crisp winter nights, sleigh bells, crackling yule logs. Remember those. After Black Christmas, they'll never be the same again. Black Christmas. If this movie doesn't make your skin crawl, it's on too tight. Rated R. The girls are all planning for their big Christmas musical number that is unfortunately in the same hall in which the boys are worshipping the god of smug curtis. And even the deer is looking at them with strong, trying to picture you naked vibes. Like in all cults, they just do it during regular hours when there's people in the building, and they leave the doors unlocked so anyone could just look in. How else will you lure in new members? This all seems legit. It can't be too terrifying. It's covered in PG-13 or edited for a green band trailer blood, which does come into play later on. <laughs> It's like dorm purgatory. If there's not a cult in one room, there's a date rape in the other. What the hell's going on in the third door? <laughs> Excellent. Classic panty raid shenanigans. The true college experience has arrived. There's more important things, though. Here you go. Let's get all of that vomit out. I know I should tell you there's a cult across the hall where they're practicing a blood oath on a crying statue, but we can get to that later. We've got a song to sing where we call out the rapey frat boys, where again, we also come across like dicks. No, absolutely not. You know the choreography and you sing. Yeah, but he's here. This way of life is unsustainable, Riley. Yes, thank you. I will choose your words for you as I guilt trip you into going on stage to sing about your own rape. There's almost some good satire throughout this whole movie, especially in how the frat guys look alike, and I'm not really sure which is which. Hell, it's even followed by their rape song, Up in the Frat House. Don't say that this was my fault, cause what you did is called assault. Aw oh, shit bro, this is gonna make our follow-up cover of Baby It's Cold Outside seem really awkward by comparison. Yeah. 
bad timing, bro. Unfortunately, while they're on the lookout for the evil frat guys, the movie seems completely unaware of creepy male feminists. It's <laughs> Riley, right? Yeah. Oh, I was really impressed. That, that takes guts. Somehow you're the creepiest, most sinister-seeming one in the movie, and the film has no idea. I'll sign it. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was cool that you got them to get rid of Calvin Hawthorne's bust. Uh, and the way Professor Gelson yelled at you in class was really lame. And he's not even funny either. Why is Santa Claus scared of getting stuck in the chimney? Because he's claustrophobic. Ugh, on second thought, I'm just gonna hang out with the frat guys. They can do a sweet Dane Cook routine. Why in God's name would you have this horror movie about rape culture, but then dress your male hero exactly like Bill Cosby? Hell, the other characters are so forgettable they have to put the name Helena on her necklace. And if that doesn't work, here, let's put the character's name right on the door. Because fans of slasher films have no standards, right? <laughs> Slasher movie fans love it when you just cut to black. I'm fairly certain that the most blood in the movie is on the diva cup she used. And goddammit, if this is gonna be a pure flicks movie for the left, then I still want my war on Christmas! Happy holidays, Franny. Hey, Merry Christmas. Wow, Merry Christmas. You're being kinda Hitler right now, just saying. The Nazis were known for saying Merry Christmas while strangling people with decorations. Oh, there you are. Wait, wait, why did you cut? We want to see more bloody ripoffs of Exorcist 3! They still keep getting texts under the name Calvin Hawthorne, the dead founder of the school. But after finding out it's not really Michael Landon, they have no idea who it could be. Best reference some other movies to narrow it down. Hello? Hello. Do you like shitty horror movies? I was going to ask you trivia about the 2009 Sorority Row, but it's no longer that shitty thanks to this film. Yeah, yeah, okay, the Scream films, but can we reference something a little more snowy and classic? Why are you so grouchy right now? <laughs> I'm not being grouchy. I just really love throwing in Jack Torrance lines to show his toxic creativity. There are some slight throwbacks to the first movie, like not knowing when one of the sisters is dead. For instance, here they stick her up on a balcony like a sequel to The Hangover where they never found the missing friend. And I still don't trust this guy. I- uh, I was just brushing up to be you with bad jokes later tonight. <laughs> just ignore all the red flags right now. This whole school is a mess. They removed the bust of Hawthorne by student demand and have nothing to replace it with. They were gonna put up Albert Einstein instead, but they haven't looked through all of his old tweets to see if he's passed the purity test. Some are getting into the college spirit though, like Riley peeking into the windows just to see what it's like. Pluto made it look so fun. Unfortunately, Professor Elwis is here to deliver a jump scare and also show evidence that he is absolutely in on this somehow. There are no covert meetings in hidden rooms where men discuss how to bury women. Every dude is showing signs of evil. Since when do you drink beer? I like beer. What? You're drinking the Kool-Aid of the enemy becoming more of a stereotypical toxic male filled with the cores of the bandit! Cause he's the asshole in this scenario, and not Chris, who posted up their act online without asking them. Well, yeah, I, I thought the point of calling out frat boy rape culture was to inspire women. What's the big deal? So I posted this video on the internet and now you're getting harassed and threatened about it. You should be thanking me. This movie has the energy of someone who tells a complete stranger to do better while deadbolting a closet full of their own skeletons. Some of these characters have it right. It's too stressful watching them fight. I'm just gonna go into a creepy old room where, hello, we finally found the dead body from the first movie. I wouldn't even be missing if I- I mean, we'll just assume that's what that was. They cut away again. That's still less stressful than watching this internet argument come to life as if you've gotten an AI to generate a Twitter argument. Because men have all the power. Not all men have power. Did you just not all men me? Not all men are rapists, Chris, okay? I'm not. Wow, does he not like being called a rapist? What a jerk. No, no, he has to call her hysterical to get the full straw man effect. I don't give a shit! Get out! You're hysterical. I have more! Is it your time of the month? Listen to my stereotypes! I should 
be feeling sorry for these characters who are being chased by a cult of rapists. How do you screw up your character so bad that when the villains do turn up... Oh my god. And I'm like, eh. Too bad we still can't hear asshole boyfriend outside saying, If you only had some guns, huh? Hashtag gun save lives! Hell, even with the heroes, it feels like any minute now this conversation would happen. Now that we're alone, I feel safe to say I found an old holiday episode of Cheers. It was super problematic. I know, Norm Peterson never should have said those horrible things about his wife. So problematic. The movie simultaneously wants to show you how much smarter they are, yet they still have them doing dumb shit like splitting up and walking around the house alone. Clearly you need to take the broken leg girl and throw her out as a sacrifice. Sacrifices have to be made to appease the cancel gods. But not too much. We don't want to over-scare you in the slasher film. In this movie, you can do something heroic, and it will still paint you as the bad guy. Look what happens when he fights the urges of the Coors Light dick powers of evil. If someone hurts my girl, it's my duty to protect her. Show yourself, coward! This is a man who- Ah, uh, killed by my own toxic masculinity! I try saving them from a killer! Truly, I'm the asshole and deserve to die! But again, it doesn't even make up for it in the violence department. The 2006 one was also stupid, but it had crazy ass scenes of incest and making Christmas cookies out of human flesh. This one cuts away from making a scratch on someone's face. It can barely show how one of them is killed and is more interested in them saying, I would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for you crazy feminists and your stupid cuck. But with the killer dead, they wrap this up fast. Uh, wait, there's more killers? Oh my god, it is Scream. There's Skeet Ulrich, Matthew Lillard, Timothy Oliphant, and, um, whoever the killer was in Scream 3. Yes, yes, we can be annoyed by how much it's working its ass off at cutting around the death scenes, just like Santa Christ denying me my candy and giving me a soapbox. But that will not prepare you for what the explanation of the film is, or how brain-dead the characters are. Wait a minute, oh right, did I forget to tell you I saw this cult earlier in the film with their literal toxic masculinity? The cult of frat boys, led by Professor Respect the Cock, is called the Deeks, because they're a bunch of deek heads always thinking with their deeks. Ah! They were doing something with this black stuff that was coming out of the Founder's bust. It was like black magic or sorcery or something. Black Christmas, everyone! Totally the same as the first one! You know, just like how the original is exactly like the Life Zone. What?! They both have abortion in them! Context, writing, and execution doesn't exist in this dojo. When we come back, we'll learn the secret of the ooze, cause if you like the Ninja Turtles, that automatically means you have to like this. Christmas Evil. The non-believers. You better believe in Santa. Or... He'll slay you. Christmas Evil, the night he dropped in. Now that we're back, I don't know, it seems easy enough to kill these frat guys. You don't even have to show any violence to kill them. I thought that you were a fighter. Um, excuse me, it's my job to be the guilt-trippy one. Yeah, and as a male feminist, I feel obligated to help or, um, let you fight yourself. I, I don't know what the right answer is. Please tell me the right answer so you'll sleep with me. Stand with us so we can make our horror version of Eyes Wide Shut if all they could show was dry humping. Oh, and if it was about a cult of frat boys controlled by a sexist professor that uses literal oozing toxic masculinity to brainwash them into becoming rapist frat boys and it's not not a comedy. I, I, I want you to suck a fat fart because you just got zated. That's not even the dumbest line in the scene. That's just the founder uh, drawing out your uh, true alpha. Uh, yes, you will not destroy our statue of conservative tears. The toxic masculinity will ooze from our founding fathers straight into your veins. And there's nothing your feminist gods and diva cups can do about it. Those are the words of our leader, Calvin Hawthorne. Hawthorne foresaw the threat posed by women, so he took precautions in case they strayed too far out of line. You will pay for our leader's cancellation for old photos of blackface when choosing the minority scholarship. This would all be brilliant if it was a cult run by Dennis on an episode of It's Always Sunny. 
but instead we're following these characters whose idea of a terrible day is finding out that Chris Pratt woke up and had breakfast. The bastard. But props for saying some of this shit with a straight face. And the spirit of Calvin Hawthorne filled the pledges, possessing them. All we had to do was name the women who had stepped out of line. Again, it's like it's trying to be an answer to all the dated 80s college comedies, except those are still better at being comedies than this is a slasher film, because at least they kept in their jokes. The sacrifices entail collecting various items from the girls by a traitor in their midst, and I'm glad it flashed back, because I would have no idea this is the same person from earlier. Also, they're not appreciating how truly progressive this cult has become. Look, we've got a girl and we've got a black guy. Isn't that what you wanted? Nah, you're right. We can't have both. We just need one. But I did everything that I was supposed to. <laughs> just like the time Tucker Carlson snapped the neck of Candace Owens live on air. It's funny when you're watching a terrible movie and you know they put in a huge applause moment that probably didn't happen in theaters. You messed with the wrong sisters. Yay! You can see elements of what could be a clever satire. It could have been awesome if this plot point happened maybe halfway into the movie and the rest was dedicated to pure on-screen carnage and chaos, with the sorority sisters facing off against the frat boy cult. But unfortunately, this movie has no interest in being Night of the Creeps or Night of the Demons and instead wants to be Norma Ray crossed with crammed in exposition and bad LARPing. Plus another applause moment that didn't happen. We will never be broken. What? Uh -huh. Oh, sorry. I went into the restroom. Did I miss anything? Yeah, suck on my PG-13 sexist. Kerry always will be okay. He'll be reincarnated into playing more or less the same character in The Unholy. This doesn't even make sense. Landon comes out of his trance, but the others are still evil? So were they just always murderous, rapey frat boys? If so, why did they even need the toxic masculinity to turn them into murder zombies? Still, Landon will have a lot of explaining to do. I'm sorry when I said the 2016 Ghostbusters was meh. It was the toxic black ooze. It was then we decided to go our separate ways, fighting against evil dudes and burning their statues of the toxic masculine patriarchy. Or we could just tweet on Twitter. Yeah, tweeting is much easier. Let's do that. There's barely anything good you can say about the 2019 Black Christmas. A movie so arrogant, it might as well come out and say you can't hate this movie, otherwise you're a white supremacist. But instead, as a Christmas miracle, it brought together all sides. Liberal, conservative, critic score, audience score, to say, yeah, this is no good. As a slasher movie, it fails because you can't even compliment the slashing. As a commentary film, it fails because it's like hot fuzz if it didn't know it was a comedy. It feels less like Black Christmas and more like they accidentally remade Satan's School for Girls only if every line of dialogue contained the clap emoji between the words. Imagine if I Spit on Your Grave was written by someone who would have protested I Spit on Your Grave. Guess what? It sucks. It's what happens when Lisa Simpson turned in a horror movie script, but it was deemed too clever, so they let Jesse Spano write it. It's a movie about sorority sisters fighting rapists. The main character should not be this unlikable. God damn it, I paid to see some slashing. The least it could do is give me the slashing. And where the hell is Santa Cruz with my damn candy? And that's why Judas was appropriately cancelled. Not for betrayal, but for kissing me on the cheek without my consent. Here, now, have a fig bar, children. Ugh. Well, I don't know. Fig bars are pretty good, and he is making some interesting points about Schneider from one day at a time, using his powerful landlord privilege to assault the toilet seat. You are 40. <laughs> We're both 40. You're the one in the fucking bunny suit.